And we will welcome our next speaker. Oh, wrong one. Wrong one. It's there. Extra talk. Awesome. So here we have a Canadian living in Canada. We are going to welcome Jerry Wright, who comes to us from McMaster University. Would you like me to take the toast? <laughs> Good. That's, that's great toast. So thanks, Lance, and thanks as well to, to Joe and, and John and everyone here at Duke for having me back and, uh, and letting me be part of this, this great couple of days. Uh, I also want to thank Terry for introducing the new journal, the ACS Infectious Diseases. I'm an editor of that. Uh, we've had our, this, our first issue, and now we're looking for looking for your best stuff in the area of infectious diseases and chemistry as it, as it collides, so please send it to us. And um, with enough money, I'll be happy to have it out the door for you. All right, I want to talk about stuff that we're doing in the lab, which is in the area of antifungal combinations. Uh, I, I know uh, John mentioned this, uh, earlier this morning that this is an area of, of interest, and I'll, I'd like to give you my take on it today. So the reason why we're in, into this, this area in particular uh, not just in antifungals, but in antibacterials as well, is, um, is this idea of chasing down single targets um, are, always results in resistance is one of the issues. And resistance is, is a significant issue in, in antibacterials and antifungals as well, of course, in, in antivirals and in antiparasitic agents. So when you're just after one target, you can end up with mutations, and mutations are, are can often lead to resistance. And, and the same thing goes, if you just have one compound, it's easy to pump it out. But it turns out that mo many different, anti many antibiotics actually hit multiple targets, right? So my favorite example of this, of course, is penicillin. Penicillin doesn't just hit one penicillin binding protein, it hits a constellation of penicillin binding proteins. And it's, the f it's, our, f you know, it's our favorite first antibiotic, and it's a great example of, of kind of the reason, the stuff that Terry mentioned, that the chasing the, the right target, if you do the whole gene deletion story, penicillin binding proteins are terrible targets because there's too much redundancy. But I just venture to say that without penicillin binding proteins, we'd be in a lot of trouble. And you can add this, other things, membrane targets, ribosome, metab metabolites. These are all sort of uh, complex targets and not just simple protein, bind Pac-Man protein binding to an inhibitor. And, and so what inspired us really to get into this area is, is really work that was done in the yeast community uh, by folks that, that Terry mentioned, Charlie Boone, Deborah Andrews, uh, and, and stuff, who, who went to great lengths to show uh, through a series of very, <coughs> very elegant studies that the two non-essential genes um, in, a, in a cell if you knock one of them out, your cells will live, and knock the other one out, cells live. But if you knock them out together, then the cells die. And you can recapitulate that genetic exper experiment with chemicals. And in the case of penicillin, for example, you will have one molecule that blocks two non-essential um, proteins or more, and then you end up with this pleiotropic effect that results in chemical synthetic lethality. Or you could achieve this using two molecules both of which hit, um, hit different targets, yet synergized together. And our hypothesis then was that we could, if we could start to screen antibiotics and antimicrobials at sub-MIC concentrations, that is before they start to exert their effects, usually we use a quarter MIC to do this, against a panel of bioactive molecules, we'd start to uncover some of these chemical synthetic lethality or lethal interactions, and that that might be an entry point into interesting Compound, compound pairs that could be used to, to uh, not only probe biochemistry and biology of, of infectious organisms, but maybe even be leads for new antimicrobial combinations. So the f our first foray into this area was actually in bacteria, and I'll just mention it uh, quickly. It was published several years ago now. But here what we did is we took an old off-patent <coughs> tetracycline drug called minocycline, and then just interrogated against a very small panel, 1,200 molecules of off-patent drugs. And the results, uh, uh, and, and we did, we're doing this in um, a number of, of organisms, including gram-negatives like, um, like Pseudomonas. 
And what we ended up with was a panel of, of molecules that you would not necessarily predict would interact with them, but in particular what we showed was some very interesting interactions with compounds that were known to hit eukaryotic targets. So uh, tergasterol, which is a serotonin uh, receptor uh, agonist, and sericide, a dopa <coughs> decarboxylase inhibitor, and our favorite molecule down here is loperamide, which is a new opioid receptor agonist, but of course well known to everyone as, as Imodium. So Imodium and tetracyclines interact in a synergistic way to actually um, kill gram-negative pathogens at concentrations of antibiotic that w aren't, uh, aren't um, killing the organism in the first place. We spent a lot of time uh, on this and showed that we developed a mechanism of action. It turns out that, that loperamide inhibits the proton motive force, the, the electrical component in particular, and that has a synergistic effect with tetracycline, so we can talk about it if you're interested in. But, there, but it's a gr another great example of interrogating chemistry, bioactive chemistry. So these molecules that are off-patent drugs that bind to eukaryotic proteins, there's only so many ways you can fold up a protein. This is how I understand this. And so small molecules that, that bind other proteins, proteins in other organisms oftentimes can bind proteins in, in your favorite organism, perhaps without obvious phenotype, but they're actually having an interaction. And that's what we're uncovering here by using these, these, uh, these combinations. So we moved this in the, into the fungal realm as well. We did this work originally with Mike Tyers, and this is the, uh, was a postdoc in my lab, Emma Griffith, and, and a graduate student in Mike Tyers' lab at the time, uh, Michelle Spitzer, who's now a postdoc in my lab. And what they did is they took, uh, uh, again, the same uh, similar library, this time against uh, Cryptococcus, uh, Gadii neoformans, Candida, and Saxervisii, and looking this time for Molecules that enhance the activity of fluconazole. Again, we're one quarter of the MIC of fluconazole against a panel of compounds. Do we find any in interesting interactions? And here's some of the hits that we came out of it. Uh, the thing that I found really interesting about a lot of them, so one of them is sertraline, better known as Zoloft. Uh, uh, so uh, this triflopyrazine, a whole family of these. These are antipsychotics. Tamoxifen is one. Uh, vasodilator over here, and interestingly, a sphingolipid. So we're talking a lot about sphingolipids today, so a sphingolipid inhibitor uh, called L-cycloserine. So, trying to understand how these interactions are, uh, what the mode of action of these interactions are, are actually pretty challenging, <laughs> I will say. Here, what we did is we took advantage of the of the Saxer VCI um, uh, gene uh, deletion sets uh, as well as uh, overexpression sets, but this is just gene deletion data, looking for concentrations of, of compound um, that are, or sorry, gene deletions in the non-essential genes that, are that, are, that enhance the activity of, of concent concentrations of these mixtures. And what we found is a whole bunch of genes that are involved in membrane <coughs> integrity. And, member, and membrane uh, biogenesis. And so it's, so the mechanism of action exactly of how sertraline or Zoloft works to enhance the activity is a bit unknown, except that through with fluconazole, except that what we, it's definitely happening at the membrane. I'll also add that all of these compounds are sidle. So they are, our, 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 act, our triage was not only do you have to have synergy, but it also has to result in cell killing. And so that's how we, that's how we triage it down. We also were inspired by some of the work in Joe Heitman's group and, and really uh, like the Galeria model. It's fantastic to do screens of small molecules, especially pairs of molecules together. Uh, and in these pairs of molecules, sertraline plus fluconazole results, uh, sorry, in, in protection over either single drugs or no drug at all. So, so I think that got us into to the, into the area of combinations and fungi. And so, about a year and a half ago, we, s we decided we would set this up on a much larger scale. And so this is really a work in progress, and the stuff that I'm about to tell you, and there's, it, there's no sort of big ta-da pipeline, but, uh, uh, sorry, punchline. But Nicole <coughs> Robbins, who's postdoc in my lab, trained, well trained by Leah Cowan. I'm delighted to have her. <laughs> have her. Uh, and again, Michelle now is a postdoc. This time we, had a, we have a, a library of about 5,000 bioactive compounds. These are off-patent drugs, some natural products, 
um, some uh, molecules that were explored as uh, potential drugs and then dropped for various reasons. And again, going after these bioactive compounds means that they have biological targets somehow. It's, it's better, in my mind, than just screening random libraries of, <coughs> of chemicals that don't necessarily have any activity. And the idea here is to screen against uh, a, a, a large number of, uh, of organisms. So SAC is great for, because it really helps us with mode of action studies. Uh, Pombi, uh, Candida albicans, Cryptococcus, and we, we haven't done a full screen with Aspergillus, Aspergillus yet, but we've looked at a number of the hits that came out of these screens. A little bit harder to do this work in high throughput with Aspergillus in, in our lab, uh, but we're learning with the help of uh, Don Shepard at McGill. So that's the platform. We, we interrogated them against a panel of antifungals, amphotericin, because that's what everybody uses, uh, caspofungin we like, uh, and fluconazole. So these are all familiar to you in, the, in, in this room, no doubt. Uh, Terbinafine might be a little bit different. So this is a, it's a squalene epoxidase inhibitor, nergosterol biosynthesis inhibitor as well, uh, but with a different mode of action than the azole antibiotics or antifungals. Uh, it's used, uh, I think, a little bit clinically, but mostly uh, uh, not systemically. Uh, Benamil is a, is a, is a compound, uh, as well as uh, suprotonil. These are both used in the ag agricultural sector. So there's, if you're interested in, bio, in, in antifungal agents that are biologically active, you look, need only look to the crop protection field. They have a whole raft of compounds. There's a real paucity of compounds in the clinic. There's a lot of compounds out there in the agricultural area, almost none of which we know the mode of action of. Um, so that's what got us excited about it. Can we start to look at mode of action? Benamil is an exception, it's a, it's a tubulin inhibitor, but suprotonil, we don't know how it works. Um, and so we decided to just do our, our, our matrix against these comp these, uh, um, all of these molecules with, against all of the strains that I showed you. <coughs> This is just some of the data that comes out of it. I just want to show you the data. We have nice data. Um, this is just a terbinafine sc uh, screen against Candida. Um, it's, uh, it's, we do everything in duplicate. It's nice and tight. If it doesn't look good, we redo the screen. This is just another way to look at that data. This is now, most of them are not, most of these, in most cases, there's no interaction, of course. Some positive interactions, and that is there's enhanced growth in some cases. But here's, this is the sort of money shot for us, sorry. We're really interested in these guys over here that are molecules that, that are interacting with, with uh, in this case, uh, terbinafine in, in Canada. So this is the result of these uh, of screens against uh, these four strains. These are, you can't read any of this, but the whole point is this is just number of hits per screen uh, against various compounds. Way too many hits to follow up. Uh, again, this is screen one quarter of the MIC of the, of the compound against a single concentration, so about 10 micromolar, of these, uh, of these bioactive compounds. So at first blush, I mean, the exciting thing about that is that there's lots of chemical genetic interactions that are happening in, in pairs that are uncovering a really new part of target space, I think. The bad thing about that is there's too many hits, <laughs> but uh, we're gonna find ways to triage these down. The next few slides are just an example of some of these, of these networks. Again, you can't read this really well, but this is caspofungin, this is amphotericin, this is fluconazole up here, terbinafine, suprotonil, and, and uh, benamil. And, and these blue dots are chemicals in which we see a positive interaction in the screen. Um, so the interesting thing is that Candida and SAC look very similar. We have lots of interactions with caspofungin some with amphotericin, and very few with these other ones, other chemical, chemical interactions that result in cell death. Uh, similar ones here. So, but this is now, look at this. This is um, Schizosaccharomyces pombi, a fission yeast, very distantly related to these other compounds. And they think it's a very different case here. Lots of interactions with fluconazole uh, and <coughs> suprotonil. Again, we don't know what the mode of action of suprotonil is, uh, but there's lots of, of chemical, chemical interactions. Uh, very few with amphotericin and, and um, caspofungin in comparison, sorry, to SAC or Candida. 
And this is Cryptococcus, and it's just, e, it's just a, a pushover when it comes for amphotericin, at least in this assay. Uh, but lots, no, very few other interactions. And look at this, this castrofungin, there's only one. And that is, um, and that's um, cyclosporin, which is well known. Uh, so we rediscovered the wheel in this case. So this, this gives you another, another view of some of this data. It's all, you know, and we're all in the process of mining this right now. This is for amphotericin. It's another way of looking at it. These are, uh, there's a lot of overlap, in, as I mentioned before, between SAC and Canada in this case. Um, Haspofungin is well, SAC and, <coughs> and Canada, lots of overlap. You can see this is uh, uh, Canada and SAC Cerevisiae. These are all the ones that are common to all of them. And you see less and less commonalities throughout these other, these other compounds. And this is, I'll just, I'll blow over this, but it's the same idea of, of giving you these. These are, the high connectivity hits are the ones that are actually interacting with multiple species and multiple, um, multiple compounds. And those are, I think, drilling down on some really common areas, some, maybe the, the low hanging fruit of these connectivities. Um, and so we're, we're trying to pursue some of these. And, and, um, and here's, here's some examples. So this is, this is caspofungin now. Here's what we've done is, is looked, so this is candida, sac, pombi, cryptococcus, and aspergillus. These are uh, checkerboard uh, analyses. If it's, if it's dark green or if it's green, it's growing. If it's black, it's dying. This is the concentration of caspofungin going from zero to, uh, to two micrograms per mil up, up this way. And these are uh, some of the hits that we found in it that are common to many of these species. And so, so what you can so here's uh, cyclosporin A. This is well known to uh, uh, interaction. You can see it has no antifungal activity on its own, but if you add just a little bit of caspofungin, everything dies. So that's exciting if you're interested in how all these things work. And so there's a bunch. There's a lot of data to be mined here, and and we've settled on this one very interesting compound here. This is compound is called clofazamine. Clofazamine has no anti antimicrobial activity at all, or no antifungal activity, whether it's against candida, crypto, uh, pombi, uh, um, or aspergillus. But in if you titrate in a little bit of caspofungin, the cells start to die. So clofa what's clofazamine? Clofazamine is a leprosy drug. It's actually red, deep, deep red, uh, which is why I drew it like this. Um, it has a more, one of these classic sort of, it was discovered in the 1950s, one of these classic mode of actions that nobody really knows how it works. It's apparently, it, it hits everything. Um, but it's really interesting because it has this incredibly long half-life, 70 days. So we're talking about drugs that have lot, really long half-lives and what's, what are the problems with these things? Well, they're, they, have some, they have some problems. Um, so yeah, this is just an uh, a recapitulation of that data I showed you before. No activity on its own, uh, and then a very nice synergy between clofazamine and um, uh, sorry, uh, clofazamine here, the here, and um, caspofungin here. It's suppressed by sorbitol, so it's suggesting some kind of membrane cell wall effect. Uh, this is Candida albicans data that I'm showing you here. Um, Nicole got really excited about this, and then so should we, we started a little collaboration with Leia uh, to try and drill down on the mode of action. Um, it's very dangerous to come here and talk about this, this protein, but um, it turns out that mutants in the, in the PKC1 um, pathway are highly sensitive to clofazamine in and all by itself, not, in comp not, not even having to add the, the combinations together. Um, whether it's in SACS or VCI or, or in Canada, where SAC, of course, would have access to all the mutants that are non-lethal, uh, and in Canada um, to a collection of them. And finally, just to give you some more molecular data, it, uh, so this is that does activate um, uh, the SLA2 pathway of phosphorylation. As you can see here, this is just control, and clofazamine in and of itself activates this pathway. It, it probably has this connection, we think, to, to how cell wall is being inhibited. So we haven't finished all the data yet. We do have mutants uh, that we are sequencing because that's the way to do things, as Terry pointed out. Um, and I don't have that data right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this mountain of data that we now have. 
in terms of these co these chemical chemical interactions. This is just one example of what we can of what we have. It's lots of room for people if this you find your favorite compound in there that you want to be able to take it and run with it. I think what we're going to do is build a database and just send it out to the to the community. And if they find something that they want, they can they can have it because there's just way too much for us to do here. Um, so I just want to tell you where where things are going next. So all of those pretty much all those molecules that we we were working on. Um, are either commercially available, which is great, or synthetics, uh, uh, which is also commercially available. It's not the Venn diagram is not perfect there, but but when you're thinking again, and I, I was inspired by what, the, what Terry just said, you know, what what kind of chemistry should we be focusing on to move this field forward? And, and we're working a lot with bacteria as well, and and the the tendency over the last 30 years has been to really focus on synthetics. But I think it's really the natural world that's that where we've got most of our antibiotics in the first place. It's really the natural world that's figured this out, uh, including compound <coughs> pairs. Um, and so we've gone back to that. So in my group, we've made a collection of uh, actinomycetes in particular. It's heavily enriched in actinomycetes. It's about 10,000, which is nothing compared to what Merck has, but it's actually quite large for an academic group. Uh, it, it occupies lots of room in the freezers. Uh, out of those, we've, we've made uh, about 7,000 extracts, um, and these are all been <coughs> arrayed in, in uh, 96 well deep well plates for screening, so we can screen your favorite target on it. And we can do combination assays, just like the one we did. And so one of them that we've, that we've, just, uh, we've just done is, is, again, using cryptococcus. Can we, can we sensitize cryptococcus uh, to cast fungin? Uh, and this is just a small portion of the library that was done um, a, about a year ago. And this is just some preliminary data to show you where, where this is taking us. Um, out of that, we looked at about 20 uh, extracts, uh, 10 of them easily reproduced. Um, what we did is we excluded all the polyene producers, and you can easily tell this in, the, in an extract just by looking at, at the, their UV spectrum. The reason for this is that it's synergy between caspofungin and amphotericin and other polyenes is really well known, so there's no sense in spending a lot of time isolating those. <coughs> and out of that very, just a pilot screen, we ended up with, uh, with about four of them. And then we found this molecule here. Uh, it's called butyrolactol A. Butyrolactol A was discovered about 25 years ago and reported only once, as far as I can tell. Um, and uh, it has a, a very interesting mode of action that we're actually uh, following up on right now. But it does tell you that we have, um, that there are synergizers in the natural world and, and more screens like this might generate some, <coughs> some more interesting molecules. And finally, I just want to touch briefly on, on just doing these, doing um, different kinds of screens. So, so we're very interested in just looking at what happens when you plate these fungal pathogens with these wild-type actinomyces that we have growing in the lab. And can we find interesting things? And, and so look at this guy here. This is, this is 2082, not terribly uh, informative, but this is, and this, this is candida and this is cryptococcus. And if you go down and look over here, what's happening to the, to the candida, it's actually um, promoting hyphal growth. And this is just regular old media. This is not spider media or anything. Um, so we have lots of molecules that, that the molecule that's being secreted by this, this guy is doing something to candida. Uh, we have um, molecules that kill one but not the other. Uh, and those are really interesting, or they, they, have, they change pigmentation. So we're pretty uh, excited about these, just not necessarily looking for things that might be drugs, but just if you're really interested in how, these, the, how, the, how the physiology of these organisms can be changed by natural products. So we did pick one uh, to look at a little bit more. So this guy here, 2288, um, doesn't seem to do very much to candida, but it completely wipes out cryptococcus. And so these two guys here, and this guy in particular, purified and characterized this molecule. This so far is the winner in my group. It's the largest <laughs> molecule. Um, the NMR for this thing will make you shudder. It's absolutely <laughs> terrifying. It, 
good thing is is that these days you don't just you don't have to rely exclusively on um, analytical techniques to be able to figure out what your compound is. So we sequence the genome, we identify the biosynthetic gene cluster. It's a massive one too, 150 kilobases worth of of genes that are necessary to make that compound that we call ebomycin. And uh, and we figured out the biosynthetic gene cluster, and with that, you could help. Yeah, it really helps figure out the chemical structure, especially in areas where you might be, you might be a little bit confused. It's a, it's rapidly cytal uh, with, uh, with Cryptococcus, and um, and we think it's working. So we can, we've labeled it up. We've made it fluorescent. This is it over here, and it's it seems to um, to be isolated mostly to membrane uh, membrane areas. In particular, it looks like. Uh, when we drill down a little bit closer to the um, to the endoplasmic reticulum, and that's actually consistent with some of the mutants that we've been able to get in sequence um, the data that I'm not showing you now, as well as some uh, haploid insu insufficiency data. So we think it's working at at that level. The precise molecular target is hard to know. It might just be sitting in a membrane, but it's not a polyene. It's not it's not working like amphotericin is does at all. So our next steps in this, this area is we want to keep looking at, at all of this <coughs> mountain of data that we have. And if anyone wants to join in, I'd be happy to, to share. Um, in the short term, for Nicole's sake, she needs to figure out how clofazamine and casper funds is working. We did work, we have been working with Joe to try and figure out how to do this in a mouse. And it turns out it doesn't work very well in mice, which is a shame. Uh, and it might be just the pharmacology that's the, the, they're too hard to match. And it's one of the challenges of combinations, right? So combinations depend on two compounds working together nicely inside an organism. So you can put them in a dish and they work perfectly fine because you're in complete control. But the minute that you have to get another organism involved in all of the, that co complicated dance, it can be pretty, it can go ugly fast. <coughs> So I just want to finish and thank uh, these guys who I think I, I talked all about them and thank you for sticking it out uh, to the last talk of the day. So I'll happy to take any questions or we can go next door now. Thanks.